So Sadhguru, what is a creative mind? Oh. How big an answer do you want? As big as you want it. Hmm. See, the English word mind doesn't say anything because it's just one generic word which does not describe different dimensions of what the mind is. Mind is not just one something sitting here and doing something, okay? There is really no such thing as mind. In the yogic culture, there is no mind. There is a physical body, there is a mental body. Because what you're calling as mind right now is a certain combination of memory and intelligence. There is memory in your body, more memory in your body than you can imagine. If I have to get at you again, it's okay, I'm picking on you, okay? You definitely don't remember how your great-great-great-great-great-grandmother looked like, but her nose is sitting on your face right now, yes? yes? You don't remember a thing consciously, but your body remembers one hundred percent. How ten generations ago your grandmother was, your body still remembers. A million years ago how your forefathers were, you're still your body remembers, isn't it? It's not forgotten and it's not going to forget. Your mind is not capable of this kind of memory. Your body has a trillion times more memory than your so-called brain. This whole shift towards the brain and intellectual process is a new… is a European malice. They gave too much significance to thought. This has happened because they lived under a subjugated society, religiously subjugated society where you're not supposed to think anything except what's written in some book, otherwise you're dead. They lived like this for a long time. Because of this, when they got little freedom to think and manage to live, they started celebrating their thought too much. Let's understand the uh, context of thought. You can only think from the data that you already have gathered. That means you can never think anything new. You can recycle it, you can rehash it, you can produce permutations and combinations of it, but you cannot think something absolutely new. It is not in the nature of the thought to come up with something new. It can only recycle the past. That means if you dedicate yourself to your thought process, if you enshrine your thought process, you are ensuring nothing new ever happens in your life. So thought need not be celebrated like this. That's why in this culture, thought has never been given so much significance. What you think is your psychological drama, we don't think much about that <laughs> because it's your drama. Your drama is important for you, somebody else's drama is important for them. Everybody thinks their drama is the most important drama in the universe. This is everybody's experience because they're so identified with their own psychological drama. This psycholo psychological drama should not determine the nature of your life because this is just a small happening compared to the life process. Life is a much deeper intelligence than intellect. We can look at… the yogic system looks at the mind as sixteen parts. Those sixteen parts are further broken and they're taken up to eighty-four thousand parts. But now if I talk about eighty-four thousand, already there's a segment which says no, so I will make it four. I'm taking away eighty, okay? I'm being fair to you. Only four. Four fundamental parts. One is the intellect, which we have in modern world, in today's world, we are unnecessarily giving too much significance to intellect and we will pay an enormous price for this. You will come to your place where you'll know everything, but you'll know nothing of life significance, really. Today you will see this happening to children. For the first time, this generation you see, ten, eleven-year-old or twelve-year-old children, they look bored. When you were ten, eleven, you did not know what is boredom, it was not possible. It was too exciting to be alive and looking around. You will see ten, twelve-year-old children all looking bored because they've seen the cosmos through their phone screen. <laughs> they know it all. And especially in the western countries, you will see this happening at eight, ten. They're really bored, you'll see in the school buses, they're all sitting on 
bored. Because by the time you are twelve, you already had one love affair, you know what is a break, you know how to all this recover from that, you tasted alcohol, you seen this, probably you gone into all kinds of physical things and you know the cosmos, what more? By the time you're fifteen, there's really no purpose for you to exist for many of them. You should not be surprised if this culture continues. I'm not saying this is a prediction, it is sim something that I see beginning to happen. In another fifty or hundred years time, if twenty-five to fifty percent of the people commit suicide, you should not be surprised because life needs some exuberance. If too much information happens to you without experience, that exuberance will be gone and a sense of false sense of knowing becomes so strong in you. This is the danger of intellect because intellect wants to… intellect wants to dissect everything. Intellect is like a scalpel, the sharper it is, the better it is, it wants to dissect and know. Dissection works with some things, not with all aspects of life. If you want to know the poor frog, you know, you remember? The poor frog that you crucified and cut and great knowledge you acqu acquired from all the torture is unbelievable, how much knowledge you know. For the torture that that frog went through, how much knowledge you have acquired is quite unbelievable. All that you got to know. Now you got interest, suddenly you got interested, the mother that you had ignored, you want to know your mother today. Please get yourself a sharp knife, start the dissection. You may know everything about her liver, kidney, heart, but you won't have a mother left, that's all. So life cannot be known by breaking it up. You can know physical things by breaking it up. You cannot know life by breaking it into pieces. But this is the nature of the intellect. The whole modern science has evolved from human intellect. Because it's produced technological benefits, you can't argue against it because people, you know, <laughs> yeah. they, they think they're scientists, they know nothing about science. They're just enjoying their iPhone. They think they're scientists because they can do this. No, technology is fine, it's brought much comfort and convenience, but it will not bring life to us. So intellect is like this. Intellect will be useful only depending upon what it is identified with and what is held, what holds this, how steadily. So the next dimension of the mind, the first one is called as buddhi, which is the intellect, the second one is called as ahankara. Ahankara does not mean ego, this, that, it means the identity. Whatever you identified with, your intellect functions only around that. Simple, if you just identify with a nation, if you say, I'm an Indian, everything Indian looks beautiful. If you cross the border and you say you're something else, all that looks beautiful. So whatever you identified with, it's only with that the intellect functions. So ahankara is the identity. How consciously and how steadily your ahankara has been created will determine the effectiveness of your intellect. Just because it's sharp, it does not mean it'll be effective because sharp intellect or a sharp knife can cause any amount of damage to you. If you have a sharp knife, and you don't have a steady hand, you will cut yourself all over the place. That's all that's happening. Human suffering is just this. You don't know how to hold this intellect in your hand properly. Every day you're cutting yourself. So all suffering is on self-help because your own mind causing this to you all the time. No matter what happens, people suffer, whichever way they suffer because they don't know how to hold this intellect. If you had the mind of an earthworm, you would be quite peaceful. Yes? You're trying to do it in so many ways to reduce the sharpness of the intellect by drink, by drug, by overeating, by doing all kinds of things somehow to take away the sharpness because the damn thing hurts. It hurts not because that's its nature, it hurts because you do not know how to hold it. The next dimension of the mind is called as manas, which is a huge volume of memory. It is not here or there, entire body carries memory. So, mano maya kosha, this is called a huge sack of memory. 
These memories in various stacks, we'll not go into all these details considering some people have cl said a clear no. They don't want to have a mind, I'm sorry, they don't want to know anything about the mind <laughs> So the fourth dimension of the mind is called as chitta. Chitta means it's pure intelligence. It is unsullied by memory. It has no trace of any kind of memory, it's just pure intelligence. If you touch this, then you have access to what you are referring to as the source of creation because all kinds of things might have been fed to you. God is this, God is love, God is compassion, God is kind, whatever… whatever. <laughs> Somebody come, stand on the edge of this stage, say all the prayer you want to say and fall. Let me see whether compassion happens to you or a cracked bone happens to you. I would like to check, all right? All these things have been made up because whatever somebody is deprived of, they will attribute that quality to their idea of God. Your ideas of God have come only because you do not know what… how this whole creation happened. Because you don't have an answer, you made it up because you're a human being, you said a big human being is sitting up there. Oh, how can you do all this? If somebody asks, he has ten hands, so he does lot of things, not like you, whatever. It's all right for children. But essentially because you do not know how creation happened, you are coming up with explanations. So that which is the source of creation, don't believe what I say, what anybody says. Pay attention to one piece of creation, just take a flower, Pay attention to this, pay an attention to a leaf or an atom or an ant. All you will see is phenomenal intelligence beyond anything you can imagine, yes? But nobody told you God is intelligence. But this culture has said this to you in many ways. They told you Chidakasha, Chidambara and so many things to tell you if you touch your chit, the whole existence becomes yours. Everything that's worth knowing is right here because you have access to the source of creation. So these are the four types of your… four dimensions of your mind. Unfortunately, the modern education thinks by just feel, feeding information and keeping the intellect reasonably sharp, everything is going to happen. No. You will rip this planet apart looking for well-being you may lose the planet or you may manage to go to another planet and start your work again there <laughs> But well-being will not happen. If well-being has to happen, you have to dig a little deeper into this one, otherwise, no. Mm -hmm.